It's Monday, October 24th, 2022. I'm Jackson Bird. Today, why scents and fragrances have been so strongly associated with witchcraft throughout time, and how those associations influence witchcraft, feminism, and misogyny today. Plus, a wild bison has been born in England for the first time in thousands of years. And if you're in the mood for a long, lonely drive, I've got you covered both virtually and on the asphalt. Here's some cool stuff for your ride home. If you want your body or your home to smell like a witch, tons of options abound on places like Etsy. You can pick from Black Magic, Coven, A Witch's Garden, Samhain, White Witches, Sea Witches, Forest Maidens, and more. Not to mention scents to repel, attract, and otherwise alter events to your desires. Which adjacent culture has been on the rise in recent years, both the serious practitioners and those more generally enjoying the aesthetic? So it's not surprising to see cottage industry shops and big businesses alike hawking witch-themed candles and perfumes. But why are witches associated so strongly with certain scents? It's one of those questions I hadn't really considered before, but as soon as it was asked, I was exceptionally curious. Unfortunately, The Conversation recently published an article from perhaps the best suited to weigh in on the topic, Britta Agar, a assistant professor of classics at Arizona State University whose research specializes in both magic and the senses in the ancient world. The article, by the way, has the best title, Smells Like Witch Spirit. And according to Agar, that association is a very strong one. She summed it up, quote, Smells are impossible to see or touch, yet they affect us emotionally and even physically. That's similar to how many people think of magic, and cultures around the world have connected the two, end quote. And this tracks with at least Western associations with magic, which at various points were strongly tied to religion, often in a positive way, and used in place of or adjacent to contemporary science, especially in matters of healing. As Keith Thomas writes in his 1971 English history volume, Religion and the Decline of Magic, quote, The inadequacies of Orthodox medical services left a large proportion of the population of Tudor and Stuart England dependent upon traditional folk medicine. This was essentially a mixture of commonsensical remedies based on the accumulated experience of nursing and midwifery, combined with inherited lore about the healing properties of plants and minerals. But it also included certain types of ritual healing, in which prayers, charms, or spells accompanied the medicine or even formed the sole means of treatment, end quote. And Agar points out that Greeks, Romans, and Greco-Egyptians of all classes tended to believe in magic and spells, with magicians frequently using fragrances as an integral part of their rituals. Quoting Agar, Doctors believed strong-smelling plant species to be more medically effective than others. The gods themselves were thought to smell sweet, and places they touched retained a pleasant odor, making scent a sign of contact with the divine." End quote. But, as Agar points out, professional magicians, the sort who might be called on by the upper classes to heal people, curse enemies, or tell the future, think the Merlin archetype, tended to be men. But for whatever reason, fictional magicians of the same eras tended to be women, and those fictional women were using fragrances left and right. There's Medea, who used herbal potions to put the dragon and the tail of Jason and the Golden Fleece to sleep. There's Canidia, who uses fragrances to make an ex-lover ill. And it's not just witches using scents to their advantage in fiction. As Agar points out, Hera distracts Zeus from the Trojan War by seducing him, in part by dousing herself in an ambrosia fragrance. And these fictional depictions or real-life beliefs about witches underlies the persisting real-world belief that women use their wiles to lead men astray. As Agar writes, quote, 
In the patriarchal societies of Rome and Greece, women were regarded with general suspicion, especially in matters of self-control, like sex, money, and drinking. Not only were women considered liable to weakness, but they were likely to lead men into self-indulgence as well. Stories about magical sense encode these ideas, especially fears about the dangers of sexually alluring women. It was said that women who used perfumes and cosmetics could seduce men into behaving in ways they would not choose to if they were in their right minds. The poet Ovid suggested that if you wanted to get rid of love, you should pay your girlfriend a surprise visit to catch her without her makeup, her blended potions, end quote. And in our modern world, it seems to be a catch-22 that women are expected to wear makeup and smell nice, but also get accused of being deceptive when they do so. All these centuries of double standards and persecution help make sense of why there's been a bit of a witchy renaissance in tandem with the fourth wave of feminism. Agar calls it reclaiming ancient stereotypes. Those women of legends were painted as seducers, as evil in their manipulations of man, but modern women sometimes see them as powerful, strong-willed, and ruthless. Of course, for people for whom witchcraft is a genuine practice, all of these scents and products claiming to give you the power of Hecate in a bottle may seem a tad appropriative. It kind of makes me think of how, at least through the 90s and early 2000s, it was common for many people to hold many of the progressive views of feminism, but refuse to call themselves a feminist, because it was seen by some as a scary word with unsavory stereotypes attached to it. Nowadays, it's super common to call yourself a feminist, to purchase a mug or cell phone case emblazoned with the word feminist, and yet to perhaps not really uphold the ideals of the movement, or at least not stand up for all women and put your words into action. Which culture feels a little like that at the moment? There are those play-acting and aesthetic, and those for whom it's very serious. And if you're interested in learning more about the ties between feminism and witchcraft from a modern lens, I recommend Sarah Lyons' Revolutionary Witchcraft, described as, quote, an empowered introduction to the history and practice of politically motivated magic, end quote. The book takes you through a brief history of witchcraft from the early modern English history I mentioned via scholar Keith Thomas through the Salem witch trials and to today. It also includes more practical advice if you're the sort of person curious about activism or magic. And with that, I would say it helps reframe common preconceived notions about magic, just like Agger's research does and like Keith Thomas's revolutionary academic volume did in the 70s. You know, personally, I'm not out here doing special spells or anything, but I do think how and why people believe what they do and how those beliefs affect their actions in other spheres of their lives is endlessly fascinating. Like how the invisible, intangible nature of the sense of smell can evoke enough mystique to become strongly associated with the supernatural for centuries in various cultures all around the world. A bison has just been born in the United Kingdom for the first time in thousands of years. The bison is part of a rewilding initiative run by the Kent Wildlife Trust and the Wildwood Trust, which aims to boost biodiversity by reintroducing European bison to southern England. Three bison were brought over from Ireland to a semi-wild enclosure in Kent in July, and on September 9th, it was discovered that one of those bison had gone into the forest to give birth alone. But no bulls had yet been introduced to the herd, so the baby came as a surprise. In fact, the rangers overseeing the bison didn't even know the mama bison was pregnant because apparently bisons belong on that I didn't know I was pregnant show. They don't actually show any obvious signs of pregnancy for their own safety. Ranger Tom Gibbs told the Kent Wildlife Trust, quote, It's difficult to detect pregnancy in bison as they naturally conceal being in calf to avoid being hunted by predators. It's a survival mechanism, end quote. The intent was for this herd to breed eventually, and a bull from Germany was already scheduled to arrive in the coming months, but this birth was unplanned, and also means the bison in question must have already been pregnant when she was relocated from Ireland to Kent, England. 
Gibbs continued saying, quote, We've created a care plan for the calf to ensure their needs are met. These animals are wild, so we want to remain as hands-off as possible, but their welfare is at the absolute heart of what we do. End quote. And from the Natural History Museum, quote, Smaller than their American counterparts, European bison are better suited to living in the more confined woodlands that once stretched across much of the continent. The bison in this project have been released into a large, wild enclosure where they're being monitored to see what impact they have on the woodland. In the early 20th century, the European bison, or wysen, was nearly driven to extinction. The animals were hunted so extensively that they only survived thanks to a small number of captive individuals in zoos. Over the following century, the animals were bred and released back into the wild across much of Eastern Europe, with further reintroductions having taken place more recently in the west of the continent. Wild populations are now found scattered across Poland, Belarus, Denmark, Romania, Germany, and France, amongst other nations. End quote. Bison are known as ecosystem engineers because their natural way of life produces positive changes on the environments in which they live. They create pathways that other animals can use, along with watering holes and mud baths, and their dung is also nutrient-rich enough for insects and birds to feed off of. Now, despite all those positives, the Natural History Museum points out that there are critics of rewilding bison in England. Some believe that bison went extinct not due to human interference, but because of the environmental conditions which changed following the Little Ice Age. Among the supporters of this initiative, however, is Leonardo DiCaprio, who praised the project on social media a few months ago. His connection to the welfare of the animals Kent Online reminds us may stem from having to eat raw bison liver while filming The Revenant. And if you are curious what a baby bison looks like, photos and videos are at the BBC and Natural History Museum links in the show notes. If you're the kind of person who enjoys going for long, quiet drives to chill out and clear your head, but you've been avoiding doing so due to the high gas prices, I've got a browser game for you. It's called Slow Roads, and it's a procedurally generated driving game in which you just drive around empty, scenic roads. No other drivers, no stoplights, no worries. Developer Anslow intends it to be a chill experience, calling it a soothing escape. Though, like Rob Bashiza from Boing Boing, I had a lot of trouble controlling the car at first, which made it the complete opposite of soothing. Bashiza wrote, quote, No sooner did I get behind the wheel than I skid off to one side, pick my way through the trees, only to find myself unable to return to the asphalt because of the crash barrier, and then endure miles of off-road scrambling because I missed the pop-up saying press R to reset car, and wanted to engage with the simulation in good faith. I end up up lost in the woods and nearly submerged in a lake." End quote. Navigating does get a little easier as you work out the sensitivity of the key commands, and you can change perspectives, seeing the car, being in the car, just seeing the road and no car, which might help different people in different ways. There are also casual, normal, and hard modes of driving, as well as the option to switch to driving a motorcycle or a bus. And the customization is one pretty fun part of the game. You can pick between sunrise, sunset, sunny, cloudy, and nighttime within each of the four seasons. You can also change to off-world mode and drive around on Mars, Venus, or the moon. It's not accurate, just a fun representation. There's also an auto-drive mode, which, while it seems kind of counter to the point of this being a game, I did actually find it genuinely soothing. Could even be a fun thing to cast up on your TV screen as a sort of screensaver. Slow Roads just launched over the weekend, so snags are to be expected. The developer has listed a bunch of features they may explore in the future with enough interest and perhaps with enough donations since they are committed to keeping it free and not introducing ads. Some of those features may include more vehicle types to choose from, more locations, competitive leaderboards, and generally improved optimization. But if you want to take this game out on the real roads, I am also linking to an article listing the quietest, loneliest road in each U.S. state. 
Telematics company Geotab used 2015 data from the Department of Transportation's Highway Performance Monitoring System to determine the route in each state with the lowest annual average daily traffic, or AADT. 2015 was a while ago at this point, but I don't know how much these routes will really have changed too much, except for ones like US Route 50 in Nevada, which was declared America's loneliest road by Life magazine in 1986 and subsequently saw a boost in tourist traffic. But the top five, not too surprisingly, are in Alaska, North Dakota, Montana, Nevada, and South Dakota. The quietest route in the country is State Route 11, or the Dalton Highway in Alaska, which sees just 196 vehicles a day, most of them ice road truckers. Big Think points out that, by comparison, the busiest route in the country, a stretch of I-5 in the Los Angeles metro area, sees 504,000 vehicles a day. Geotab also worked with landscape photographer James Q. Martin to pick the most scenic routes from the 50 loneliest ones, and you can explore those state by state on Geotab's interactive website, link in the show notes. You know, maybe it's because I grew up going on very long road trips across the unending flatlands of Texas, but driving for hours without seeing another soul is one of my favorite pastimes. Last summer, I did a cross-country drive from New Mexico to New York, and setting out early in the morning from Santa Fe, once we got out of the city, it was hours before we saw another car. With the sun rising over the mountains as we drove, it was absolute bliss. So if you've got any sort of road trip coming up and want a similar escape from interstate traffic, be sure to check Geotab's site for a reliable, scenic route. Well, all right, that's going to be it from me for today. This show was produced by Ride Home Media. I'm Jackson Bird, and I will talk to you again tomorrow.